sin. Now throw it all out because it doesn't matter. Everything human beings do is in response to a feeling. It's either a feeling they want more of or a feeling they want a whole lot less of. Your job is to find out what those feelings are and give it to them. It's really that simple. Okay? Now remember, the process of influence happens on different levels. But everything we do, regardless of the story we attach to it, is based on the feelings in our body. Okay? The moment the body feelings shift, the reticular activating system goes into effect, our consciousness changes. It's that simple. Data doesn't change. The meanings we assign to it and the inferences we make and the behaviors that arise from those inferences is what creates change. Now, the fastest way to change another person's state is to change yours first. Change yours first. Okay. Interactions with people are always a yin and yang. There's always a feedback loop that's in place. Your job is to understand and be aware of that feedback loop and navigate and govern the changes. Okay? When we talk about feedback loops, the one that comes to mind for most people most right away is the, the, the proverbial mind-body feedback loop, right? What we think creates what we feel, what we feel creates what we think, ad infinitum. By the way, with regards to the manual, don't worry about the manual. All right, unless I specifically say certain, go to certain pages or whatever, you have your whole life to read the manual. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> right? You won't need it if you follow the instructions. But you go back and you follow up and you find other things that are cool and you work them into your, your curriculum. I got five days to put you through a, a process that allows you to embody this, this training. Three is the magic number. We call it three by three because the way most people learn is that the, 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 the teacher, can we get a little bit more volume without, or close these doors so that the uh, airport and stuff doesn't interfere? The way most people go is you come to a seminar, you sit down, the, the instructor, lecture, 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 demo, practice, back, lecture, 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 demo, practice. No, that's, that gives you borrowed information. What we have discovered through years and years and years of teaching people to go out and be able to do this stuff in a very short time, is the minimum number of repetitions that you need to do to embody anything on a functional level is three. Three times as a subject, three times as the operator, you get multiple perspectives, you get the rote memorization and the body muscle memory, metaphorically speaking. Now you can go out there and actually do it. Okay? So really embrace this idea of just rolling up your sleeves, doing the drills, and getting the skills. Have as much fun. Be as playful and creative and, and crazy with it as you can. Because the more you play, the faster you learn. When you, when you go out into the world, take that playful energy with you. Because nothing diffuses anxiety, worry, stranger danger than playfulness. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to embody certain states, how to create certain default states in your body. That's part of the training. You're going to get that, right? We're going to teach you what we call four ba the four basic, think of them like the starter set for your emotional templates, right? We'll call it Master and Commander, um, Rockstar Metaframe. Uh, open heart trust trigger, and then we'll probably teach you the Hakalau pose, uh, which is extremely powerful. But along the, along the path of learning that, I'm gonna, you're going to gain the ability to customize and design your own so that you have these things on demand whenever you need it. So state control as we define it. Actually, let's start with this. This is the CPI model or we like to call it the Universal Persuasion Protocol. Control your state, get rapport, use your language, manage their state, jump into their process, bond to their criteria and values. So you'll hear me often refer to the center of the persuasion bullseye either as criteria and values, which is the old NLP term, but you'll also hear me use the words the emotional bonding checklist. Emotional 
bonding checklist. Your goal in any interaction is to bond what people emotionally want and need to what you're offering them in a way that they recognize it. It's that simple. The longer you keep them in that process, the more readily they'll do business with you by default. Business being going out on a date, buying your product or service, becoming a client, giving you a good review, networking, it doesn't matter. Everything human beings do is in response to a feeling. All emotions are feelings. Not all feelings are emotions. Very important distinction. All emotions have a feeling, but not all feelings are emotions. In trauma work, many times people will have a body feeling or a set of emotions that they can't put a name to. Because they can't name it, they can't process it. So you have to do something creative like, oh, turn it into a color and then they can get rid of it, right? So, this is the formula that you follow in any situation where you must influence another human being to do what you want them to do. But there's one step right before this, right before this that we have to have, and that's know your outcome. You gotta know what you want, because if you don't have a clear idea of what you want and how you know you're getting it, you're probably gonna wind up with something else. Okay? Now, outcomes don't need to be complicated. They can be as simple as, I'm going to make that person feel amazing. Right? And then your agenda moves from there. Well, okay, this person feels amazing. Do they have anything I need? How do I make Amelia even more amazing so they'll want to give it to me? Right? Your outcome should have two basic ideas. What you want and how you know you're getting it. How are you going to calibrate? Are you moving towards what you want or away? NLP gives you this long, drawn-out process that every time I look at a new version of somebody else's NLP, the frickin' list gets longer and longer and longer. Keep your shit simple. Why? Because if it's not simple, you're not gonna do it. If you don't do it, you're not gonna get better at it. Make it fun. If it's not fun, you're not gonna do it. If you don't do it, you're not gonna get better at it. It's a simple formula. Find the fun, keep it simple, right? So. Repeat after me, if you will, with vim and vigor like you really want to be here. Control your state. Control your state. Get, rapport. Get rapport. Use your language. Use your language. Manage, their state. Manage their state. Jump into their process. Jump into their process. Bond, to their Bond to their criteria and values. Again, control your state. Control your state. Get, rapport. Get rapport. Use your language. Use your language. Manage their state. Jump into their process. Bond to their criteria and values. One more time with feeling. Control your state. Get rapport. Use your language. Manage their state. Jump into their process. Bond to their criteria and values. All right. Pop quiz. You're at a networking function. You see somebody who looks interesting. What's the first thing you're going to do? Then what are you 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 going to do? And then? Holy shit, Batman, I think they're getting it. You're at a bar. You see some hottie or hot guy or whatever hottie means to you. What's the first thing you're going to do? Take a cold shower. Control your state. Get rapport. Use your language. Jump into their process and bond. You're going to court. <laughs> You're going to be a star witness. <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, okay. You're going to teach a seminar with a bunch of people. What are you going to do? You get pulled over for speeding. <laughs> what are you going to do? Before, use their language. Manage to stay. Jump into their process. Bond to their criterion. Universal persuasion protocol. It does not matter where. It does not matter who. 
All that matters is that language and human beings are involved. Control your state. Get rapport. Use whatever language skills that you currently possess. If all you know is echo technique, that's what you use. If all you know is active listening, which I don't recommend, but it's better than nothing, that's what you use. If you have rhetorical persuasion techniques, that's what you use. The formula is, they think of it like, you know how you have these little X's and Y's in an algebra equation where you just fill in the blank, fill in the variable? That's what this is. I, how do you control your state? Some people, it's a fifth of Jack Daniels, right? Some people, it's Kava Kava. Some people, it's meditation. Some people, it's posture breathing, like I teach, which we're going to be doing, right? How do you control your state? Whatever it is, that's what you use. You get rapport. What rapport skills do you have? Some people, it might be talking about the cool pictures on their wall. Some people, it might be echo technique. Some people, it might be classic NLP matching and mirroring. Whatever, you, whatever tools you have, that's what, and that you're good at, that's what you use, right? Use, um, manage their state. Pay attention to, the, to where they're at. Pay attention to the state you're in and where you need them to be and figure out how many iterations do I need to go, go through to get them from the state they're in to where they are, and how do I manage that change, right? We're going to give you certain key conversational frameworks that act like training wheels until you don't need them anymore, and they become a basic part of how you move through the world, right? That's all you need to start. Keep it simple, right? And then jump into a process again. How do, you, how, do you, how do you elicit from them how they've done something similar in the past? And how can you fit what you're presenting to what they've done in the direction path? Like if somebody's bought a house and they loved it and you're going to sell them a house, you don't want to ask them about a house that they hated. You want to ask them about a house that they bought that they loved and fit to that process. People are very, very transparent with their processes if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And the best part is you don't even need that if you have the echo technique. Because 80% of what you need at that level is already handled. This is why the echo technique, my friend James, God rest him, he hated this technique. <laughs> he hated the echo technique. Not because it didn't work, it's because it was too simple. James liked complicated shit. I just don't know, I don't know why, but he's just, he was just his thing. A lot of, a lot of neurolinguistic programmers like complicated stuff because they think it's advanced. That's not the definition of advanced techniques in my world. Think about advanced technology. Shouldn't advanced technology be easier to use? Shouldn't it do more stuff with less work? Right? If your iPhone, if you had to type in DOS, a DOS prompt to do, use your iPhone, would you use it? Exactly. So in my world, advanced techniques mean they're easier to use, they cover more shit, they're more reliable. That's how I, count, that's how I qualify it as an advanced. And I can use it in more places. That's how I qualify an advanced technique. A lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't follow that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't embrace that because it's not complicated or sophisticated enough. <laughs> right. All right, so I want you to understand that whatever tools that you have already if you just follow this formula, the chances of you getting your outcome go up astronomically. Now we're just going to keep laying, adding multipliers to this. Okay? So let's talk about state control. State control, as we define it in Planet David, is the ability to enter or exit, in other words, transition, from any psycho-emotional state to any other emotional state at will and on demand. Right? So for those of you who want to really develop this skill, uh, probably one of the best resources is method acting. Method acting, right? Some of the best hypnotists on the planet are actors. If you think about what their, their, their whole craft is designed to do, one thing, suck you out of your reality and into theirs. To convey authentic, real experiences and emotions and engage your mirror neurons. That's their whole training. So there's no place that method acting will not help you in this. Okay, in fact, this will help you get more auditions. <laughs> right? So we want to learn to generate authentic, bona fide emotional states and then operate from within them without them controlling us. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there's two ways that you control your state, through your physiology and through your cognition. Okay. We talked earlier, I mentioned earlier, we have feedback loops, the mind-body feedback loop. Right? Most of us are taught that the mind controls the body. If you're a classically trained hypnotist, your, 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 your whole training is all about the idea that people are in your chair because they're manifesting a physiological problem that's lodged in their mind. True enough to be true. Functionally, however, the inverse is true. Maybe just tear it down a little bit, uh, Walt. Functionally, no, the inverse is true out in the real world. Your psychology doesn't control your physiology unless you're well-trained. What do I mean by well-trained? Elite athlete, Buddhist monk, yogi, heavy, high-level meditator, elite soldier. These are people who have been put through hell and, and had been forced and trained to, to be very rational, critical thinkers under extreme situations. Unless you fall into one of those categories, and what you're being exposed to was trained in that context, the inverse is true. Your physiology, the body, the body processes, control your psychology. Okay, that is the average human condition. Right? For every psycho-emotional state that you can conceive of, there is a corresponding physiology and breathing pattern that allows that state to manifest in your body. Now, as you get more and more evolved and more and more sophisticated on the emotional palate, the body language or physiological distinctions in your, in your posture and breathing will get very small. There may be very little difference between sly and flirtatious, right? But can you feel the difference? Right? It's just a tiny, it, it, they're both naughty, they're both mischievous, but there's a, the, 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 the body language difference is little, but it, it can create very different kinesthetics receptions. And that's the thing I need you to understand first, is that once we understand the power of physiology, this becomes your platform, it becomes your foundation. Right? And as long as you can control your physiology and or your breathing or both, nobody can knock you off your game for any length of time ever again. And that's big, because so much of what happens in combative persuasion is frame control. It's destroying a person's frame by, by making them feel or belittling them or whatever. And so if we can hold a positive, powerful frame through our physiology, it becomes very hard to break us psychologically. Okay? If we get knocked off kilter, we catch ourselves going into a less than resourceful physiology, all I have to do is remember to change it and hold it for as little as two minutes, <clears throat> and I'll break that pattern and I'll go back into a resourceful state. Okay? So, first thing we're going to do, any questions about that so far? Because we're about to do some drills. Okay, everybody stand up. And give yourself some room. This is where it gets fun. All right. I want you to close your eyes, if you will. I want you to remember a time in your life when you saw something you really, 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 really wanted. And I want you to add a few parameters to it now. I want you to think of something that you wanted on a scale of zero to 10, it had a lust factor of 27, and you decided you were gonna get it no matter what. And you made a plan. You put that plan into operation, and no matter what got in your way, no matter what obstacles appeared out of nowhere, you went over, around, through, you worked that plan, and boom, you nailed it. Home run. I want you to remember that moment of victory. I want you to remember what you were seeing in that amazing state, what you were hearing, what you were smelling, what you were tasting. When you do that, when you see what you see and you hear what you hear and you smell and you taste what you smell and you taste. There's an amazing, wonderful feeling that you get. As you become aware of that feeling even more so now, remember how you were standing in that moment of victory. Remember how you were breathing. And stand that way now. Breathe that way now. 
Take a moment to just really lock in that physiology. Take a snapshot, a physical and mental snapshot of it so you can get back here anytime you want. Become fully immersed in those feelings. And here's what I want you to do next. Without changing a single thing about the way you're standing. Without changing a single thing about the way you're breathing. As an act of will, try to feel bad. Notice what your body tries or doesn't try to do. When you're done with that, stop testing. Let those wonderful feelings double. And allow your eyes to open and look up here. Okay, newbies. What happened when you tried to feel bad? You didn't want to? What did your body try to do? Did you try to change? Did you try to go down? Yeah. So here's the secret. I told you to summon up all your willpower and beat your physiology. Could you do it? That's right. Your physiology trumps your... No, I can't use that word in California. Physiology controls your psychology. Right? This is why we start with physiology first. Now, some of you may have noticed that when I asked you to try and feel bad... Maybe you found yourself, you know, you're, you're in this great winter posture. You start to feel bad. You try thinking about a bad thing, and all of a sudden your body wants to kind of will through. That's the only thing you need to be aware of to make this work. As long as you can become aware of when your body wants to start wilting, and as an act of will, put yourself back in the posture, the states can't engage. So as long as you can control your posture you can control your emotional state. The training comes in putting you in more and more progressive situations where the environment is going to make that more challenging for you. And that's where my Systema training was all about. Because there was always another level. There was always another layer of shit to put on the, on the training, right? But my point is, is that I had you summon up your willpower and you couldn't beat your physiology. That's important. Because if you, can understand, if you can master your physiology, nobody can push your buttons. You can enter any state you want. You can custom design states, lock them in, and move through the world, emanating them into a whole room. Right, this is the beginning of your Jedi training. This is, and it gets crazy. Okay? So, but because there's a yin and yang to everything, I want you to close your eyes now. And what I want you to do is I want you to Think of another time in your life. I'm going to give you the parameters of this. You find uh, an example of this that you think is appropriate, that you saw something you really, really wanted. On a scale of 0 to 10, it had like a lust factor of 20. And you made a plan, and you worked that plan. Only this time, right when you thought you were going to get it, something happened at the last minute, and it, pff, gone. You realized you weren't going to get it. I want you to remember that moment of disappointment or defeat. What were you seeing in that moment? What were you hearing? What were you smelling? What were you tasting? Remember how you were standing if you were standing in that moment. How you were breathing. Become very aware of that and hold that posture. Hold that breathing pattern. And when you know you've got that, summon up your willpower and without changing a thing about the way you're breathing or the way you're standing, as an act of will, try to feel bad or try to feel good. We're not going to stay here long. Now what I want you to do is you're feeling those feelings. I want you to summon up your willpower. I want you to hold on to that negative feeling. But as you hold on to that, as you try to hold on to that negative feeling with your willpower, shift your body back to the winner's posture we did earlier and notice what happens. Shift your posture more if you need to. And then stop trying to hold on to those negative feelings and let those wonderful feelings come back twice as strong as the time before. When you know you got that, open your eyes, look up here. Have a seat. What'd you notice? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play Mike, Mike guy.
Yeah. You looked like you were going to say something. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I, did, I did notice, actually, this time the, the memory that was connected to the negative thing like, actually just left my awareness. Just left your awareness? Yeah, the whole, the whole scenario was just like... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. As you go through more and more of the clearing stuff, those things will go faster and faster because you're, you're getting less and less attached to things. It's easier for you to let them go. What would you notice when I had you hold on to the... when I had you go into the negative physiology? Do you feel like crap? Good, no. What happened, what happened when I asked you to, tr to summon up your willpower and try to feel good? Could you do it? Okay, so when I asked you to hold on to the negative feeling with your willpower and then shift your body back to the winner's physiology, what happened? Just couldn't hold? So you can't fucking follow instructions. <laughs> I told you to fucking hold on to that feeling. I, I can't work with you motherfuckers. That's a, no. no, that's actually, no, great job. Right? And the reason that, that it's important to have the experience of it, right? And then it's important to keep doing it, right? If, if all you ever do it is this one time in the class, it's just a parlor trick. Make it a way of training, just like boxers, you know, they throw thousands of jabs, thousands of uppercuts, you know. These are, these are the tools of your trade, the ability to control and manage your state, to go into any situation or circumstance and be able to be on your game starts with your posture and your breathing. Posture and breathing is always going to come down to this, right? And here's why. I had you use your willpower multiple times through these drills to do the opposite, to consciously will yourself to do the opposite of what your body was telling you to do. If you, if your physiology is in chaos, which is what environments do, highly emotional environments do, they throw us into a state, they can knock us off our game, they, they knock us off our equilibrium. You cannot, no matter how much learning you have, you cannot access your cognition, you cannot access your cognitive skills. If your physiology is in chaos, Right? That's why they say you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to the level of your training. Right? If you don't have that training, then you're at the mercy of whatever stimulus comes your way. So you have to have a way to train, and this is how you do it, by understanding the difference and the pecking order, the order of precedence or priority in physiology versus psychology. Your willpower is at the mercy of your body until you've trained it otherwise. Now, the book you want to reference for this information is called Willpower by Roy Baumeister, okay? Willpower is a finite resource. It's based on two basic fundamental attributes, the amount of sleep you've had and the amount of blood sugar in your system, okay? You have a finite amount, and you burn through willpower units, units of a, your ability to override your emotions every time you engage in critical thinking or have to quell an emotional response. So the more, the more emotionally volatile my environment, the more rapidly I'm going to run out of the ability to control it. Unless I just go dead, which means I go apathetic, which is, again, another form of trauma. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean I'm not being traumatized. It just means I'm not connected to it, so I'm not aware the house is burning down. It's kind of how it works, right? It was one of my big problems with NLP for a while was because um, a lot of the doctrines that people were espousing were creating these dissociative walls between trauma and the, and the person's current experience. And in my world, because I, I dealt with terminal cancer and all these, these other things, that was like building a cement wall, like a plexiglass wall between the ha part of your house that's burning and the part of your house that hasn't burned yet and said the house is okay. And it's not, right? Just because you can't feel it doesn't mean that shit's not there. In fact, in Chinese medical Qigong, you know, we say if you can point to where you feel it, you can change it. You know what the, the Qigong doctors say? If you can't feel it, you can't heal it. So a lot of times people go into these denial systems, and they, uh, Scott Sonnen calls those, those places we lock in our body sensory motor amnesia. Your body forgets it's there. They're numb spots. And just like a thaw, you know, an ice cube thawing, when we start to melt them, the pain comes back, which is why people want to run away. But this is not a therapy class. But it's important to understand that these, these systems are always at play. Whether you're conscious of it or not, these are parts of the things that are going into every decision a human being makes. And they're stimulated 
through the interoceptive information coming into the environment, the context of the environment. You're going to learn to engineer all of it. But the fastest way to override the environment, the fastest way to override the people, is by controlling your state through your physiology, your posture, and your breathing. Okay? So there's a, if you think about it, visually, um, your, your posture and breathing is on a continuum. When we talk about people who are noble, um, very moral, high integrity, we use words like stand-up guy, straight shooter. Um, give me some others. Straight as an arrow, right? That's a posture reference, right? We talk about people who are evil. What do we say? They're bent. They're twisted. Thank you, Mary. Right? So there's a continuum locked into your physiology. There's a memory that your neurology sorts by. Good symmetry takes up space. Good, positive, healthy, desirable. Bent, twisted, asymmetrical unhealthy, evil, nasty, right? <clears throat> this is part of your physiology training. You need to understand that if you want to exude authority, exude certainty, exude what they call um, command of presence, you've got to be vertical. You've got to be symmetrical. You've got to take up space both vertically and horizontally, right? These are the things that put you, first of all, just standing that way will make you more certain. It'll make you more solid. And so anything that comes out of your mouth will have more gravitas. It'll have more impact on the people. Unless it's strategically to your advantage to put yourself in a one-down position, a place where you're not quite so certain. Right? Where you're not giving off the master of the universe vibe. So the idea is to go in and out of these states at will. Can you feel the fluctuations when I change my physiology? Right? Do you know, this goes even for the, 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 the Royal, um, the, I forget, that's a, one of the big risks, Royal Shakespearean Theater Companies have a stage technique for actors on stage to, to change your perception from a, from a half shot to a full body shot to a head shot. It's, I learned it from Ronnie McDowell. On, he, was on a, he was doing a clubhouse. So like, we'll, talk, we'll teach you this in, in uh, Charisma and Conversion. Like, if, if I want you to look at me full body, I'll just move. Right? If I want you to look at me from the waist up, I'll just stop and move my hands. If I want you to just look at my face, I'll only, I'll only look at my, I'll only move my face. See how I'm controlling your field of vision? Which is what? Attention. Attention is the currency of relationships. If I can control your attention, I can control everything else. Right? So there's a lot to the body. Right? But the first thing is if you can't control your state, it's going to get controlled for you. Posture and breathing. For every psycho-emotional state that you can conceive of, there is a corresponding physiology and a breathing pattern that allows it to manifest. Now, you guys, we always, start, we always start our classes with our favorite power pose and hooked on a feeling. There's a reason for it. It's to remind you that everything human beings do, including you, is in response to a feeling that you want more of, you want less of, and that you can control that, phase, that, that feeling by controlling your physiology. Right? Now, Amy Cuddy, how many of you are not familiar with Amy Cuddy's power poses? Anybody? Okay, if you haven't, go read. It's, it, there's a, a, a YouTube TED Talk called Power Poses by Amy Cuddy. I've been teaching this stuff for almost 20 years, but Amy did the actual scientific research, and what, we, what you're going to learn is beyond just what she teaches in Power Poses. But she did the science, so if you want the science, she's got it. What she discovered was if you would take people and hold these positions for as little as two minutes, there would be a reliable state change, and in the vast majority of cases, the hormonal balances in people's bodies would shift. Testosterone went up by about 20%. Cortisol dropped by about 20%. What did that mean? Is you were more confident, more assertive, more authoritative, and more relaxed. Does anybody here not want to be more relaxed? Anybody here not want to be more confident, more assertive? 
right? I'm not going to pass judgment on assertive or non-assertive. I want you to modify assertive. What's appropriate in a situation? Sometimes it's strategically to your advantage to not be assertive to get your outcome, right? And that's one of the things that NLP taught me that I really, really liked was it's not about good or bad. It's about what's useful. NLP doesn't care if the science says it's there or not. It cares about if it works, right? At the end of the day, that's what we should care about. It's nice if that we have science to back these things up. But at the end of the day, when we go and apply these things, do they actually yield a payload or a payoff that is desirable? So physiology, stake control. We're going to give you four, 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 first day with the new hand, four uh, different metaphysical, or meta, meta, we call them metaframes, even though it's, it's not completely accurate. So we talked about uh, at the beginning of today that there are four pillars of irresistible hypnotic influence. First one we talked about was authority. Second one was attractivity. Attractivity being the ability to generate and manage states of attraction in yourself and other people. The third one is called affinity. Affinity is the sense of sameness, of connection, of affiliation with another, with a person or a group of people. Right? You could think of it as rapport. Right? Um, in, in a lot of ch like in some of the studies that we that have referenced, if you've got a group of people. Uh, and one person sees smoke coming up from under the door and wants to get up and leave, but nobody else wants to get up and leave, that other person will stay there in most cases because the rest of the group gets refused. That's an affinity tactic. That's social, that's consensus, right? Same ideas, and again, you can, you can find these on YouTube. Um, uh, if you have somebody who is uh, like a plant in a group and everybody's giving the same wrong answer, and this one person gives the right answer, that person many times will change their answer to comply with what, because they want to fit in. That's affinity. That's the need to be accepted. Now that's a primal drive. Um, so is social status, by the way. Most people don't realize that. Uh, we talk about your three brains. You have your reptile brain, your, your, your limbic system, or your mammalian brain, and your neocortex. Status is actually a survival trait that goes right to the primal brain. Um, the need to be accepted by a group also goes to the reptile brain because societies, the reptile knows that societies protect its high status members and that being part of a group is analogous to survival. Conversely, expulsion from the group is analogous to being, to extinction, to being killed, right? And so we fight for these things. Right? Whether we're conscious of it or not, we're fighting. When you, when you echo somebody's words, you're triggering a very, very, very deep, very, very primal need for affiliation. And raising your status at the same time. This is one of the reasons why everything shifts when you start echoing people effectively. Okay? So, authority, attractivity, Affinity, acquiescence. Acquiescence is kind of the, the freebie. In any given room, about a third, maybe a little bit less, will do what you tell them just because you told them to do it. Now, if there's a room of 20 people, there are three or four people in here that will do whatever Alex says just because Alex told them. But those same three people won't do it because Seth told them. A different three people will do it because Seth told them. So affinities or acquiescence is kind of a weird one. Um, the idea, though, is the more you amplify the other, two, other three pillars, the, the more that number goes closer to 100. Okay? So we want to start playing with this idea of going into the proper... Once we know what we want, we have to ask ourselves a basic question. Who do I need to be for them to be who I need them to be so they'll do what I want? Right? Remember, the fastest way to change somebody's identity is to change yours first. Who are you in their world? Because that'll dictate the, the version of themselves that they bring to the fore. And the behaviors that they generate and the perceptions that they generate will all come from that identity state. Right? So, who do they need to be? Who do I need to be to get that to happen? That's the simple question. Right? So, for authority, how many people here have ever seen the movie Master and Commander? Okay, if you haven't, go, go rent it. 
for just the first 20 minutes, then you can do whatever you want with the rest of the movie. Right? But there's a really good scene there that I always reference when I teach this, this, this part of the course. Because at the, at, the, at the establishing shot, you know, it's, it's dawn on the ocean. There's this beautiful three-mast warship. And it's, it's, it's really quiet. The fog is clearing. You see all, this, all the sailors. Some are scurrying up and down the mast. Some are depth testing. Some are navigating. Some are, are manning the, the helm. But the entire ship is running like a finely tuned machine. Like everybody's doing exactly what they do. Everybody's in place. Everything's the way it's supposed to be. And then slowly the, the door to the main, cap, the main deck opens and out walks the captain. And he just, he just walks out and he just assumes that pose that says, this is my world and everything is the way it's supposed to be. And it's just Russell Crowe standing there and just observing the entire ship. And there's no doubt as he observes his world that he is the master of that ship, that he knows how to do every single one of those jobs that those sailors are doing. But he knows that those sailors, he trained those sailors to do, and these people to do those jobs, and they're doing it perfectly. And he knows with absolute certainty that if anything changes, if anything happens, all he has to do is say the word or take one small action, and it's handled. Now, you've all been in situations and circumstances where things just work like clockwork, where you trained people or you taught people or you were part of a team that maybe you were leading and everybody was doing their job, and, but, but you were in charge. You felt in control of that environment. You knew everything that could happen and you had an answer for every single thing that could come up. True, not true. If you didn't, imagine what that might be like. So everybody stand up. <laughs> 